Sure, and thank you, Wadsworth Area Historical Society. I've had the privilege of meeting uh, some of you, Roger included, um, as he said, several other historical organizations and meetings, and I would encourage all of you to get involved with, with those organizations as well, um, including the, the Ohio Local History Alliance, uh, who has a, a wonderful, they had a wonderful statewide conference this past weekend, and Northeast Ohio Inter Museum Council, and Ohio Museums Association, I could go on and on. Um, so we're gonna talk about an orange cat that likes lasagna and hates Mondays tonight. We're talking about Garfield, no, just, <laughs> just kidding. How many of you survived the Republican convention this summer? We all did, right? Okay. We're going to talk about the guy whose Republican convention was the longest political party convention in American history. Two weeks in Chicago in late June of 1880. Now, we thought that, you know, four days in Cleveland in 2016 was hot enough. Okay, but we're going to talk about a guy who became his party's nominee on the 36th ballot. Okay. Roger mentioned there's a Wadsworth tie. So, uh, and we'll talk about really the Civil War, but I'm going to put the Wadsworth tie out there right away. During the Civil War, Governor, uh, Governor William Dennison charged then Lieutenant Colonel Garfield in the late summer, early fall of 1861 to recruit troops for his unit, the 42nd Ohio Volunteer Infantry Unit. When Garfield was commissioned as a lieutenant colonel, um, Governor Dennison said, you're in charge, you're the officer in charge of the 42nd Ohio. And he says, great, where do I get my guys? You gotta go find them. So he went throughout the Western Reserve, he went throughout this area, to the communities that he preached in primarily to recruit soldiers for his unit, including from this township and from the surrounding townships here in Medina County. Garfield would write in his diary in, in uh, late 62, 1862, 1863, that uh, a noble young man from Medina County, all of about 18 years of age, was, was killed in battle. And he would rather um, take his place than have to deal with this young man's father, who he basically pleaded with to let his son serve. So it was a, it was a boy from northern Medina County. Um, and, and those are the ties. So when you look at the Civil War memorials throughout the county um, and you see the names, if you were to cross-reference them with the list of soldiers, the roster of soldiers, you will find 42nd, uh, I believe it's, it's company, uh, company D and E um, are the Medina County boys. Um, company A came from Hiram, those were his former students. Uh, and then it basically worked west. And then he, he came back home to Cuyahoga County for company G, which uh, recruited some boys from my township and then went west again. So those are, those are some of the ties. Um, as an elected official, James Garfield only represented Medina County when he was president of the United States. So we'll, we'll uh, talk about a little bit about him and that, uh, that aspect of his life too. So we're gonna talk about his life and, time, life and times and I will, I will put in as much Medina County uh, relevancy as I can. Real quick, um, I do a little museum consulting but I'm also uh, currently also serving as the Acting Chief of Resource Protection at the Bedford Historical Society of Museums. That's fancy pants museum speak for safety and security. Okay, uh, I, have, I have nine officers uh, under, underneath me. Uh, they're all former law enforcement and history guys. That's a great combination. And we keep our museum campus safe. I, I was interested in when, when Roger was making his remarks about the keys, we just went through rekeying a building, but to have stuff missing, um, always an area of concern. So my, my officers are uh, doing that, um, making sure that doesn't happen, they're not stealing stuff. They're making sure nothing gets stolen. Um, but it's important just to, re, re, just real quick, to watch these facilities, these great historic structures that we're all the guardians of. Um, because over the past couple of years here in Northern Ohio, there's been a rash of vandalisms and, and break-ins on historic and cultural sites, including cemeteries. And President Garfield's monument wasn't immune to this in May of 2014. Um, but the good guys won and they got the guy and they, the suspect has been picked up on a warrant. And, but anyways, there's, <coughs> it's, it's important that we're
Okay, so um, I'm, I have academic background in history. I'm working on a second master's down the road at Ashland University. Um, I received my, my first master's from the University of Akron, and then I did, some, uh, did my undergraduate work at Bowling Green. So um, I've never really left northern Ohio, and I've gotten to, to learn this guy. Um, but real quick, I want to give you some suggested readings. Um, if you're interested in Garfield, first of all, how many of you saw the movie that came out by PBS in February, Murder of a President? Okay, go to PBS's website. Go to pbs.org. Click on the American Experience, and it's now on there for free. You can stream it for free. It's called Murder of a President. It is based off of Candace Millard's book, Destiny of the Republic, which if you haven't read and you like if you like the CSI and the murder show and the crime shows, this book is, is essentially a murder novel. Um, so Destiny of the Republic. Well, let me backtrack the Buckeye Presidents real quick. Great reference source. Um, great reference source. If you ever just want the gist on all eight presidents who call Ohio home. One book I didn't put up there is Dark Horse by Kenneth Ackerman. Uh, Dark Horse essentially is the narrative of the, the 1880 Republican Convention and how James Garfield came to be the candidate. Um, if you want to read the Garfield books, start with Dark Horse and finish up with Destiny because it makes a nice sequence. It takes you from the nominating process, um, from really Garfield's support initially of John Sherman through his assassination. And then finally, Ohio Politics, you want the 1994 edition. Um, it's a great book because it gives you a good retrospective on Ohio politics from the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, more of a reference, but some good anecdotal stories in there. Here's, uh, here's the books that, uh, two of the books that I, I've recommended. Um, great, great book. And, and now you can find them all fairly, fairly reasonably priced. Real quick, of course, you all know, before we get to Garfield, we've got to talk about the other guys um, that were president. And of course, if you're one of those middle 19th century presidents, facial hair was the rule. You had to be a Republican, a general, and have a beard in order to be the president. Okay? Um, and then William McKinley said, you know what? Not only am I the last Civil War president, I am using a razor. So. And then Taft started it up. Actually, Teddy started it up again. But, uh, but you know, Ohio is important. And of course, you know, our state motto, you know, welcome to Ohio. We'll pick your president for you. This has been true since really 1868. You know, we have, and it's because of Ohio being the microcosm of the nation in terms of industry and transportation and people and demographics. And that's why Ohio is the center of the political universe. Oh, good Lord. Where'd that go? Okay, there we go. That's young James Garfield. That's, he's about 17 years of age in that picture. That's when he went off to hire him. He's born in 1831 in abject poverty. He's born on the banks of a tributary creek to the Chagrin River. The last of the log cabin presidents, he is hard scrabble dirt poor. Um, and all he had was one book, the Bible. That was his only book growing up. He didn't have shoes till the time he was a teenager. Um, and he shared this teeny tiny log cabin, which our, our colleagues in Moreland Hills have, uh, have a replica of, with uh, his mother and his sisters and his brother, two sisters and a brother. So um, his job as the boy was to keep the fire tended and um, to be the little brother. You can go see his birth site. The village of Moreland Hills does have uh, markers surrounding his birth site. So, um, but you can, you can experience the replica cabin. 1850 is important because not only um, was that the church of his faith, this would be the second place and really the, the first school that he called home. Um, the Disciples of Christ Church, the, the Christian churches, so, uh, you know, um, their, uh, their, their symbols, the chalice with the, with the uh, saltier cross in it. They wanted to train ministers. They wanted to train teachers. Um, so they, they founded what was known as the Western Reserve Eclectic Institute, now known as Hiram College. Um, James Garfield was there as a student uh, in the mid-1850s. The mid so... 
um, he, he went there. And then, and then, not only did he go there, he came back um, to be its president. He, got his, he finished his degree in 1853 at Williams College, and then he came back in 1857, first as a teacher. All right, he taught religion and the classics, Latin, Greek. Let's just put the one rumor to bed. He could not write ambidextrously doing Greek in one hand and Latin in the other at the same time. Not true, not true. I, I, was, I, was, I was admonished by the true expert on, doc, on, uh, on President Garfield, Dr. Alan Peskin, about, Andrew, what are you saying? No, I'm sorry, Dr. P. Um, but he could write five languages and read five languages and speak five languages. He, could, he was ambidextrous, but that is just urban legend. Um, so 1857, he comes back as the, the, as the professor, as an instructor there, quickly gets elevated to principal, to the college president, and remains on the letterhead as the college president until 1863. Um, but in the meantime, he wasn't there for most of those years. He was doing other things. 1858, on, on November 11th, 1858, so, so what's not Veterans Day, he marries a girl that he met while they were students at the Jaga Seminary uh, in, in 1849-50, uh, named Lucretia Rudolph. Her dad was one of the founding trustees of, of the eclectic. Um, they had, they'd become friends, and then all of a sudden they're back in Hiram. Whoa, hey, how you doing? Good to see you again. And they, they spend some time together. Um, it was a, a four-year courtship. Um, and you know they kept in touch while he was up in Williamstown, Mass. at Williams College. Marries her in, in 1858. She wasn't too keen on the politics. She wanted him to have the life of a minister. He was an itinerant minister, not ordained as many people think, but he, he was a lay minister, um, but he did ride a circuit of churches. Um, I believe he did get down here in Medina County. I mean, in fact, I'm 99.996% sure. On that, we never say 100%, especially in this era of polling and data. It's, you know, no, just kidding. Uh, oh, he did, he did ride a, a, a circuit that included uh, churches here in Medina County as well. So he would be at a different congregation every Sunday. So he would go from, from for example, Bedford to, Lake, to what's now Ohio City and Tremont to Lakewood, then Lorraine County, and work his way down and, and back. Um, in March of... 1859, he wins the Republican primary for the state Senate for the 26th Senate District, which is Portage and Summit counties. Okay, um, so he, he, this is great. This is probably foreshadowing for his future life. He doesn't win it on the first ballot. See, in, in those days, now we have this lovely primary process now, and there are folks who approve this message. They didn't have that. And you know what they also didn't have in those days? Lawn signs. Okay, the flowers of fall. They didn't have lawn signs. I, I, you know, I, I actually like, I like lawn signs. I like the different designs. But they didn't have that. And, and what happened in, in that primary, it wasn't really a primary, it was a, it was a party convention. The Republican parties, uh, the central committees. Um, and if you've ever served as a central committee person for either party, it's actually pretty cool. Um, the central committees got together and they said, okay, Portage County, it's your year to put up a candidate. Because in those days, our state legislators were elected every year, okay? Every year, unlike today where our state reps are two years and our state senators are four years, it was every year. So, okay, Portage, it's your turn, who do you got? Summit County went along with it unanimously, like, hey, we, we're just trusting you. Portage County is like, well, we're not sure. We've got these two guys, let's just duke it out a little bit. And on the fourth ballot, Garfield gets the nomination by the Republican Party in October of 1859, because remember, states get to set when election day is for state offices and, and local offices now. October is when his general election is. He wins the state Senate seat. And there's the Ohio Senate chamber um, right there. And it, it pretty much looked like that in 1859 when he was first elected to the Senate. 1860. He's campaigning for Lincoln throughout Ohio, really mostly throughout his Senate district, but, but a lot throughout the state. And why? 
political figures have their two roles. They have their official role and they have their political role. So their official role is writing legislation and voting on legislation and you know, writing, getting those proclamations out. And their political role is campaigning for others. He campaigns for Lincoln. Ohio is not a slave state at all. Ohio is not starting the breakaway chatter, but these issues are important to Ohio. The most important issue in his Senate race was slavery. Now, as I once told a, a student who, um, who asked me what I thought about a certain flag he was wearing, I said, well, you're closer to southern Canada than the southern United States. So it, the issue, it was the hot button issue of the day, but in terms of Ohio, it had little to no relevancy. But, but the issues of the South were, were making their way here into the Buckeye State. So he won on an anti-slavery ticket. He became the, the largest champion, the, the most ardent champion in the Ohio General Assembly to keep the union together. And we'll talk about what he did as a state senator um, in just a moment. And he had allies from the legislature, including the state senator from Medina County, Albert Riddle, who backed him up on, on a lot of what he was, uh, what he was doing. But by the time the war broke out in April of 61, he's wanting to be a part of it. And when the war breaks out, he goes to Governor, uh, Governor William Dennison uh, and says, Governor, put me in the game, coach. I'm ready to play. You know, let me command some troops. I'm a senator. I'm a leader. Political generals were all the rage in those days. Governor Dennison says, I got nothing for you yet, Senator. Just bide your time. Bide your time. Comes back a few weeks later. Governor, hey, I'm, I'm waiting. I've been practicing my military drill. I've been studying. Garfield's not a professional soldier. 85% of the officer corps are considered professional soldiers because they went to West Point. Garfield did not. Garfield learns how to be a soldier by reading Napoleon and studying his tactics. Okay? And after Senate session, he and his best friend, State Senator Jacob Dolson Cox, go to Broad and High in Columbus, right in front of the Senate building, or right in front of the State House on the Senate side of the building. And they practice military drill in their Brooks Brothers suits. Okay. Then they go back home where they're, where they're living together and they study. <coughs> By June, Cox has been commissioned as a full bird colonel. He's part of the Army of the Kanawha. He's getting ready to, to head out. Garfield's like, come on, Governor, I'm ready to go. Let's, let's move it here. Governor's getting annoyed. Okay, Governor's getting annoyed. Not good. Um, and he says, just wait. So he says, go to Springfield, Illinois, and get enough rifles and supplies for a unit, for an infantry regiment, which is you know, around 1,000 guys. And he goes and he comes back, all right, Gov, I've got it. Can I be a full bird colonel? No. No. You can be a lieutenant colonel. Aw, oh, shucks. I, I don't know. I'll, I'll just wait now until I'm a full bird. He keeps waiting. He's waiting. Finally, in August, he's like, all right, mercy. I yield. I'll take it. So the folklore goes that um, had he just, had he just, waited a little bit, and the, the governor had thought, has, had thought about, it. he would have commanded either the 7th or the 8th Ohio, which are two pretty notable units in, in Ohio military history. So he goes, and then he, he makes the rounds through, north, through Northeast Ohio, including here in, in Northeastern Medina County, recruiting troops. So part of when Garfield would do this, he would go to those disciples' churches he would appeal to religious fervor. You're fighting God's war. You know, to, to free our African American brothers and sisters, to bring justice to the slave, to, you know, they, this is the pitch. And a lot of the folks who he had built relationships with through baptizing them or you know, preaching to them, or just getting to know them as he rode the circuit, were in his unit. 
So throughout the fault, this time, so imagine this, 155 years ago, you see this, this bearded guy in an in a army blue uniform with Lieutenant Colonel Epplets on his shoulders, and you're going, wait, wait, isn't that our preacher? What are you doing here now? Okay, and then it's, well, the South has broken away, and the whole story, and, you know, and, and what's interesting, and what really inspired Garfield to fight to preserve the Union and want to get in the fight is, South Carolina, within a month of Lincoln's elections, already saying, we're gone, you know, and it's about preservation of the Union. So, um, College gets Company A, and, and then, like I said, it goes, it goes, uh, it goes forward. So, with these, with this band of, of men from from all throughout northern Ohio, they go down to to Camp Chase in in Columbus, which is uh, right about well, it's right near um, where Huntington Park, where the Columbus Clippers play, the Indians AAA affiliate. I have to incorporate baseball in this. It you know it's. You know, I have to. By the way, James Garfield, huge baseball fan. Um, but they go to Camp Chase to train. And now he's got his unit. He's a real colonel. He, he gets elevated to full bird. They're done training, and they get their first orders. Head down to Cincinnati, meet up with the 43rd, I'm sorry, with the 40th, and then you're going to this little place in eastern Kentucky called Middle Creek. It's a supply line. And Garfield, as a bird colonel, is squaring up against Humphrey Marshall, who's a Confederate Brigadier General. Okay, first of all, it's very rare to have subordinate rank versus superior rank. It just doesn't happen. Um, and that actually goes to the rationale of why Dwight Eisenhower in World War II was the first of the nine five-star ranked general officers and flag officers, because they couldn't command the other troops from the other countries. So, Go back to the Civil War, it was, it's very rare to have a colonel versus a general. Garfield has about 1,800 men under his command. Humphrey Marshall has 2,500 men. And what Garfield does is just a stroke of genius. So they have an elevated position. The Union guys under Garfield have an elevated position. They've got the Rebs in the valley. And they're laying siege. And then Garfield tells the guy, start running back and forth. This goes for a couple days. General Marshall on the Confederate side is going, where are all these troops coming from? <laughs> right, right. Until essentially they just choke them out and get this supply line. This is a, this is a significant yet insignificant battle, because they're like, Okay, first of all, who's this James Garfield guy? Secondly, where is Middle Creek, Kentucky? Okay, it's, so he, uh, he does this, and he, he wins this victory, and he writes back to the governor, sends his report, and he writes his friend, Dr. J.P. Robeson, who is a, a mentor to him and a confidant, essentially a, a second father figure. His father died when he was about 18 months of age. And Dr. Robeson, who, who's from my hometown of Bedford, his house, where his house stands is now some apartments. Um, I was trying to think of a great adjective. They're lovely apartments. Um, he writes, and he goes to the governor. He says, Governor, look at this gallant act by this wonderful officer. You should promote him to general, to Brigadier General. Now, for those of you keeping score at home, that would be his third promotion in about six months. Okay. Right. I want that fast track, let me tell you. Um, and Governor, Governor David Todd at this point is like, no, no, I, no, just not happening. State Senator Dr. Robeson is going, come on, come on, come on. So by April of 62, Governor Todd elevates James Garfield to his first star the Brigadier General, and backdates the commission to January 14th of 62, the day after the battle's over, officially. 
for you know gallantry and superb leadership and yeah. Um, so he dates it to he dates it January fourteenth, makes it effective January tenth, so that it's a general versus a general in the official record. And then, and then, this is great. Garfield goes home. He's on he's on leave. He's suffering from camp fever. He goes home for a couple months. Now he's been married officially for just a little under four years at this point. He and Mrs. Garfield had only spent a total in those four years of 20 weeks together. Okay? Ladies, some of you are going, how can I get rid of my husband for that amount of time? Okay? I'm sorry, Wadsworth TV. The jokes get worse throughout. I'm sorry. So, <laughs> so he goes to Washington. He meets up with John Sherman and some other folks, Sam and Chase former governor of Ohio, now Lincoln's secretary of the treasury, they introduce him to Lincoln. President Lincoln says to him, General, congratulations. You know what's going on. You have first-hand knowledge of how this war is going from the field because you've seen it through your own looking glass. But I need you to help me fight this war from a seat in the house. I need you to run for the 19th district of Ohio. <coughs> Lincoln recruits him to run for Congress. He's being a good soldier. Sure, you're my commander in chief, I'll do what you need. While he's in the field, while he's in the field, um, getting his new assignment, he gets elected to Congress with an effective date of office, January 3rd, 63. So the area he represents in Congress is really what's now st most of Congressman Joyce's district. It's Ashtabula, Trumbull, Lake Geauga Portage, and a little sliver of Mahoning and a tiny bit of Summit. But that's his district. Okay, He lives in Hiram, so he lives in the district. Even though the Constitution says you don't have to live in the district. And then uh, eventually he'll, he'll move, but he's still claiming Hiram is home. Doesn't take his seat in 63 until until later on but in eight in in September of 1863 this is important because this is where um, a whole bunch of Ohioans a whole bunch of Ohio Ohio had the most significant impact as a state combined militia regiments at the Battle of Chickamauga okay Ohio Ohio reigned supreme even though it was a loss for the Union there's a whole bunch of Ohio in there, including men and women from Medina County, in, in several regiments. Garfield is serving as chief of staff to General William Rosecrans, okay, whose brother is the Archbishop of Columbus at this time. So you, those of you who follow high school sports have heard the high school Bishop Rosecrans, brother of the general. September 20th, 1863. Garfield's a two-star, or is almost a two-star general. And Braxton Bragg's forces are collapsing in on General George Thomas. Garfield and Rosecrans are watching from an elevated position. Rosecrans says, I'm getting out of Dodge and going to Chattanooga. Garfield, you coming with me? Well, I am your chief of staff, but, but, I think they should hold the line. Garfield rides back under heavy fire, okay? His two orderlies that are with him are killed. The horse that he's riding named Billy is shot, okay? And he tells George Thomas to hold the line. Ultimately, Thomas loses to Bragg, pushes the Union back to Chattanooga, but for that, for that heroic act, Garfield now is the stuff of legend. And Thomas gets the moniker the Rock of Chickamauga. In his official report, Garfield essentially says that um, that Rosecrans says he was overtired, he wasn't making good command decisions. Rosecrans will find out about this later and never speak to Garfield again in a positive manner. Okay, 
So now Garfield's a legend. He gets promoted to two stars. He resigns his commission in November, right around Thanksgiving, about Thanksgiving time. November 63, takes his seat in Congress 11 months into his term in December of 63. And now he's fighting the war from the House. How many of you saw the movie Lincoln? Great, great movie. Okay. I like that movie because it's historically accurate. Tommy Lee Jones's character was Congressman Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania. By the way, there's a Thaddeus uh, Stevens Society. All those lines that Tommy Lee Jones said on the floor of the House were taken directly from the congressional record. Okay. Garfield spoke during those couple of days, too. For two and a half days, actually, he spoke. There's not a single reference to him in the movie. There's a reference to a congressman from Wayne County, okay, um, but no Garfield reference, no Garfield quotes. But that was the, that was the speech of the, the beginning of the, the 13th Amendment. Garfield's in his second week of his second term when that's going on, and he's leading the charge for Lincoln on the abolition of slavery. So now we fast forward, because I'm going to go a little deeper uh, into this. I'm going to fly through some other slides, but this is where he's, he's building alliances throughout Ohio. He's a nine-term congressman. Nine-term congressman. So we've just jumped 17 years, by the way. That was, that was a pretty good jump. Um, he's United States senator-elect, because until 1913, the state legislatures picked the U.S. senators. Okay, so March of 1880, he's chosen to replace Senator Alan Thurman because legislators from all over the state think this is the guy to represent us in the Senate because he's such a great orator. He's such, a, he's such just so knowledgeable. You know, he, he's a self-trained economist. He understands tax and banking policy better than anybody. He wants to create a Federal Bureau of Education. He's trying to get us back on the gold standard. He's argued a case before the Supreme Court and won first, last, and only case he ever argued as a lawyer, won and done. Thank you very much. How do we not take him? And it's because of the legislators from Northern Ohio that made the push and got the rest of the state on board that he got that. Um, and that's what the rest of the country saw at the Republican Convention in 1880 in Chicago. Okay. This is what's interesting. Everything that Ohio saw that he was essentially blind to. He just thought, he's like the reluctant candidate. I'll, I don't, I'm not going to push myself into the office, but if I'm asked to serve, I'll think about it. When he gets up to make a speech for John Sherman at the convention, General Sherman's baby brother, all right, and he ends his speech with, what do we want? And somebody pipes up, we want Garfield. He's going, whoa, wait, no, hold on. Take me out of this. I'm here for him. And John Sherman's going, uh, Jim, uh, you got some explaining to do. Why are you here? I'm here for you, man. I'm here for you. Then why are they? I don't know, but I'm still your lead guy. And on the 34th ballot, Garfield's placed in nomination. Okay. How do you remember from this summer of the talk? Oh, there could be a brokered convention, and if it goes to multiple ballots, the, there might be a resolution to unbind the delegates. And we heard all that, right? And actually, some of the, some of the folks on TV made references to Garfield's convention. It's hot. It's Chicago, so it's really hot. They're in wool, and they're there for two weeks. 
So not only, you know, it was literally smoke-filled back rooms trying to figure out who's going to be the nominee. There are seven Republican candidates for president in 1880. Ulysses Grant is the favorite. He, he missed being president. His, the Republican Party was in three factions. His faction was teed off at, at President Hayes. President Hayes was only a one-termer because he committed to one term after the Electoral Commission of 1877, which we'll talk about for a second. You thought Bush v. Gore was funny in 2000? Wait till we talk about 1877. And Garfield is now the eighth choice, after a bunch of them have not made enough votes. You need 350-some you need votes to get the majority. Nobody came close. Nobody came close. Because you had some heavyweights in the race. You had, you had Ulysses Grant. You had James Blaine. You had John Sherman, who ended up not being a heavyweight. You had Elihu Washburn from Illinois. You had, um, oh, the other three. They're so essentially insignificant, you forget them. But the point is, at that time, they were significant. 35th ballot, he gets nearly enough. 36th ballot, he beats Ulysses Grant. Grant is not happy, naturally. Okay, That's the understatement of the day. Grant's handlers are incensed. It wouldn't be until late September of, 60, or of 80 that Grant's folks would publicly agree to be supportive, okay? Um, here's the interesting thing, too. So political conventions now are essentially big commercials for their respective parties, and they're scripted down to the minute, okay? And the acceptance speech is always done on Thursday in prime time now with the balloon drop, and yeah. By the way, 400,000 balloons in Quicken Loans Arena this year. All blown up by high school students, which is really cool. But I digress. They had they had this machine, like you know. Anyways, um, the only reason why I know that is because I was downtown the day they were blowing them up, and I saw the school buses around the queue. It was kind of cool. So, anyways, um, the nominee always gives the acceptance speech on Thursday in modern conventions. That's not how it worked in 1880. James Garfield basically waited a month and then sent a letter saying, it's cool, I'm good, I'll be your nominee. I'll be your nominee. Um, and, and by the time he got back on the, on the train, um, he got off the train in Menor, he, he did send a letter to his wife saying, um, are you okay with this? This is going to change things, just so you know. You know they, they, have, they have five kids you know, from 17 to 7, you know, they're, they're, you know, their life's about to be dramatically different. It's, and it's not living in the bubble like our presidential candidates live today with the Secret Service and all that stuff. Um, and Mrs. Garfield's like, well, sure. You know, she's not real happy, but she's not going to stand in the way. He gets home to Menor, there are people waiting for him, mostly from northern Ohio, but, you know, because word traveled at the speed of a telegraph in those days. So the news had made it back here to Wadsworth and to, to Strongsville and to, you know, Hudson, and, and people knew that, hey, we have a presidential candidate in our midst, so let's go hear what he has to say. And they greeted him in his front yard. And during that summer and fall, nearly 17,000 people uh, went to his house. There are stories of how folks would steal things from his farm, like potatoes or pumpkins or other root vegetables, and they would camp out on the lawn, and you know, they they made <laughs> they made his home their home. Um, but also there was there was a press corps that was there too that had telegraph capabilities. He had, a, he had a telegraph wire on his property and they telegraphed back to Dubuque and Poughkeepsie and wherever they were from, letting folks know what was going on in Menor. So he gets elected November 2nd, 1880. And, you know, 
This is how this works now. We have all this instant feedback on voting, right? But we don't know for a week who's going to be the president. That's pretty much how it works now, right? They knew by midnight that night. You know, they knew by midnight. And, and it was after Delaware and New York and Jersey had come in. Ohio had right before. They had the electoral votes. James Garfield beat Winfield Scott Hancock. So there wasn't, like we have today, there's not the transition team. There's no, there's no saving of the records and none of that. So Garfield's hanging out at home in Menor from election, really from the summertime through February 28th of 81. He leaves Menor for the last time, gets sworn in March 4th. Bad move, fellas, you're going to agree with me at this. He gets sworn in, he takes his oath. First person he kisses, not his wife, he kisses his mother. Really a double-edged sword, probably should have kissed the wife first. Um, but he kisses his mom first. His mother is the first presidential parent to witness their child be sworn in. She's, uh, she's north of 80 at that point. Um, and then July 2nd, 1881, he's shot, and then he lingers for 80 days, dies of sepsis, blood poisoning. He dies 80 days later. So that's the overview. I, I just want to, I'm going to fly through a couple slides. I just want to hit a couple key points um, because I know we're, we're going to run short on time. First of all, political parties. Um, the Republican Party is seen, you know, really from the time of Lincoln through um, the time Grover Cleveland gets elected. Grover Cleveland is the first Democrat to get elected after the Civil War um, as the preservationist of the Union. Okay, that was, that was the Republican Party's big thing, it was to keep the Union together. They were formed in 1854. Um, our Ohio presidents, just so you know, uh, last half of the 19th century, you had to be a military officer. That was key. That was key. Um, they didn't talk about executive experience a lot, even though most presidents uh, or many presidents were governors, uh, not just from Ohio, but we had two governors. But you see they had, uh, they had political chops. Also, Ohio has the highest percentage of presidents from one state that have been assassinated. Okay. Um, and, and we can get into that. Also, um, you had to have, for the most part, facial hair. Um, so Garfield, we talked about his state senate time. Uh, he lived in Hiram. This is interesting, too. He only won his hometown by four votes. OK. Every vote counts. You're going to hear that now from now until election day. Because, because early voting started today, you're going to hear this every day on TV, radio, and on your Pandora feed on, on the internet. Every vote counts. If you're only winning your hometown by four votes, if I'm advising you politically, you need to make amends with whatever neighbor your kid's ball went over the fence of. Okay? Seriously, you, you have to lock down the home base. It's a little scary. Um, okay, 54th General Assembly. So, so he introduced some bills, and really they're very technical bills, okay? You can thank James Garfield for property tax assessments. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, you can also, uh, he's also really the, the father of the Akron School District. And um, you know how ODOT does the highway maps, and it has a little, like the highest point on there and the lowest point? Yeah, James Garfield. Um, he, he wanted to make sure that education was a priority, though, too. He, um, he also introduced a bill to support libraries, which is, which is cool. Okay, the 55th General Assembly, it was all civil war all the time. Okay? Um, make treason a state crime. Translation, if you're a copperhead, if you are a sympathetic Democrat to the South, you're getting charged with treason. Um, weights and measures. So when we go fill up our gas tanks, we all see the county auditor sticker on the gas pumps and on the scales at the grocery store, and James Garfield. Um, let's see. Uh, and then organizing and fighting the state militia, the National Guard. You want to make sure that they had what they needed to fight the war. Um, he, um, he was on the Education Committee and what's now the Board of Regents. And then he, um, he went to celebrate a train line, which is kind of cool, uh, if you like trains. Um, 
his lasting legacy in state government, the Ohio Department of Ed, the National Guard, and the Weights and Measures. So those auditor stickers, we should memorialize them here in Ohio as the James A. Garfield auditor stickers. All right. Um, Civil War presidents, we had five. Um, the politics of the war era. Now, in many of our communities, especially in the, in the township system, like, like Wadsworth, like Medina, Sharon, Bedford, you know, where I come from, church was home base for everybody. It was the center of your cultural life, your political life, your social life, your civic life. And the politics stemmed from the church. So slavery was a huge, huge, uh, huge issue. And when you're in Portage County, like James Garfield, and there's a guy by the name of John Brown, who's one of your fellow Portage Countyans, he's bringing that issue, you know, he's elevating it pretty hard. You know? So how many of you are familiar with the Kent State shootings of 1970? Okay. On May 2nd of 1970, there was a bar in Kent called JB's that was burned. Okay, I learned this at two years ago's OLHA conference. JB's stood for John Brown. That was John Brown's house in Kent. Yeah. There were times where Garfield and John Brown would be in the same community, like two ships passing in the night. They never interacted. They, they just missed each other. And Garfield was asked on the campaign trail once, do you condone his behavior. And Garfield kind of dodges the question. He says, no. But he says, but I'm empathetic to it. I can understand where he's coming from. So um, Garfield would never call himself an abolitionist, but he had abolitionist leanings. And many of the communities in this part of, of northern Ohio, because of the influence, really, of the Disciples of Christ Church, had those abolitionist leanings. Okay. Oberlin, while not a disciple school, it was a, is, is a religious faith school, big abolitionist, of course, we know that. Hiram, abolitionist leanings, disciples of Christ Church. Um, Garfield um, also led the fight to make sure that when President Lincoln, on his way to D.C. to be sworn in in, in February of, of 61, before the March inaugural, he said, I need 10 regiments of militia. Garfield led the, the cause for not just those 10, but for at least 13 more than that. So Garfield was the, the biggest driving voice of, of the war. All right, we talked about his uh, wanting to serve, uh, recruitment, the Battle of Middle Creek, uh, his elevation to general, Governor David, Th the governors weren't too keen on him. I, I wonder why. Okay, nine terms in Congress, and then we'll get to the presidency and the assassination. I'll, I'll, answer any questions you have. Um, he, want, he wanted the Department of Ed. Because he came from such a hard scrabble background where he didn't have formal education until later in life, he understood the value of education. He wanted to make sure every kid had a shot to go from really nothing to something. That's why he, he was so ardent on education. Um, the gold standard, so he, um, he's a self-trained economist. He basically just wants a full accounting of the money. So that became one of his pet issues. He never got elevated to the chair of the Ways and Means Committee because folks in the party didn't want him. But he was the, essentially the resident economist on the Ways and Means Committee, the Taxation Committee. And then both in the General Assembly and in the Congress, he developed the position of majority leader because of his oratory and his, his, his public speaking skills. Um, Real quick, Electoral Commission of 1877, up until Bush v. Gore, the most contentious election was 1877. And it got kicked from the House of Representatives to a 15-member commission. It's Rutherford Hayes versus Samuel Tilden. Lucky for Hayes, five of those members are from Ohio, four of whom are from his party. Okay, And Garfield happens to be one of them. And it was supposed to be seven Democrats, seven Republicans, one independent. Five from the House, five from the Senate, five from the Supreme Court, with an independent justice being that 15th member. Well, that independent justice basically willingly takes a demotion to become a federal judge in Illinois, where he's from. And now all of a sudden, the Republicans are able to get a, an eighth member. Rutherford Hayes becomes the, the 19th president of the United States on a vote of eight to seven. Garfield helped them out a little bit. 
fellow Ohioan. They served together in Congress. They knew each other from the war. Um, and then Hayes, after the South cries foul, is a lame duck. He says, I'm only running one term. And really, he doesn't pursue any of the, the things he wanted to do. So, and if, if Hayes didn't do that, we would have been heading back to war. And that's how divided the country was. When you look at the electoral votes, it was 185, 184 in the Electoral College. The popular vote was divided by 38,000. So, yeah, it, um, it was a little, little contentious. And really, you see the beginnings of the Solid South, and New York and Massachusetts defected. Um, Connecticut basically does what their New England brethren do. New, New Jersey does what New York does politically in those days. But you have the Solid South, and that Solid South up until the 1920s counted Indiana. So we mentioned that he was a senator. The seat that he holds, that he, he was supposed to hold, is now held by Senator Brown. 1880. Folks are in his front yard. He, he speaks to folks right here from his front steps. Um, they have 20 acres across Menor Avenue. It's a cornfield. Um, people would gather as small as a couple dozen, the largest over 2,500. Um, fifth Republican in a row, third from Ohio right in a row, 18, 19, 20. Because Ohio was looked as not only the bellwether, but really truly reflective of the nation. That's why we have so many presidents in such a such a quick span. Then, of course, he has the second shortest term of office when he's shot. On his 120th day in office, he dies on his 200th day in office at the age of 49 years, 10 months. And he did not have protective detail. Secret Service doesn't start protecting presidents in a limited role until 1894. Um, after the assassination of President McKinley in 1901, that's when they start doing essentially full-time principal protection, even though their primary mission is to investigate counterfeit money. Um, Garfield blows out Winfield Scott Hancock, who's from Pennsylvania, another equally important state in the Electoral College. Hancock was a Civil War general. First political office he was seeking was president. There's his house, which is now a national park, 7.92 acres. And then today, there's all sorts of Garfield resurgence. And family tree. Um, he had five kids. He had seven kids, two of whom died as toddlers. First and the seventh died as toddlers. And then our Ohio presidents and presidential candidates. So with that, thank you for your kind attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. OK, there's a quiz at the end. No. <laughs> I know we went through rather quickly, but thank you for your kind attention. Yeah. In fact, I got to see in Columbus today that there's a display on the ground floor of the House of Representatives side of the house of, of campaign artifacts from all the Ohio presidential campaigns, which was just really cool. And I would have taken pictures of them had I not run out of memory on my phone. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, where, where he and, and Senator Cox would practice their military drill. There's a statue right about that spot to Ohio's Civil War great ones. And he's on that statue, which is really, really cool. And there's some great references to him in Columbus. So, and the only president whose birth site and a couple places where he lived and final resting spot you can see in one day in about a five hour round trip. Yes, sir. I, I'm familiar with the book. I haven't read it. Um, I, like, um, I like Conwell's Life of Garfield written in 1881. That's a good one. Um, but I can't give you an authoritative opinion on, on that other one. Um, if you want the authoritative biography on him, which is about yay thick, um, it's Garfield by Alan Peskin. And that, it cites a lot of those sources. So, you know. If it's on the internet, it has to be true. No. Um, it, it, uh, if it's anything like Conwell, it's probably pretty good. R.H. Conwell is good. The, the really, the great sources of his are his diary, which are four volumes, published by Michigan State University. The letters between him and Burke Hinsdale, who was the, uh, the, the president of Hiram College, succeeding him. 
and then the letters between him and Mrs. Garfield during the Civil War. Those are some great, those are some, some great dialogue there. And she, she often asks him about the operations of, of the House, and, and especially when he's in Congress, the operation of the Menor Farm. But he seeks her advice and counsel on a whole bunch of issues. It, it's, it's almost like a, a John and Abigail Adams where he would consult with her. But, but she was a very trusted advisor to him. You know, she's the second first lady to be college educated. You know, so so she, she wasn't just the social hostess. She, she was an art educator by training. She's, she's a really cool historical figure. And then what she does after his death to memorialize him and to organize his papers and to make sure that his legacy is not forgotten is just simply remarkable. Yes, sir? You were aware of the fact that yeah. Yep. Yep. And that um, the uh, Garfields spoke right behind us where we are right now. Mm -hmm. right yeah. So, so Garfield, you know, not only did he speak during the campaign here, you know, he preached here in Wadsworth. The Hinsdale connection is huge because they were colleagues at Hiram and they became close as brothers. And then Hinsdale said, you know, we'll get you back to Wadsworth. Um, Hinsdale, Hinsdale's an interesting figure too because um, you know, he really wants to professionalize teaching. He's, he's one of the first presidents, uh, how many of you went, when you're in school or when you had your kids in school, they loved that Friday off in October, any OEA day, any OTA day, or St. Neota day for our Catholic school colleagues. It's this Friday. That's this Friday, <laughs> right, right. I'm looking forward. Yes, you are. Burke Hinsdale, this is really cool, Burke Hinsdale, president of Hiram College, is the third or fourth president in the history of the Northeast Ohio Teachers Association, which is, which is just remarkable because, you know, some of the advice and counsel that Garfield was looking for as it related to trying to, to govern and regulate education, he would, he would consult with Hinsdale through their letters and through conversation. Yeah. And the OEA day is a great day. It's a great day. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, you know, the, I, I didn't know much about Wadsworth other than go Grizzlies, right? And, <laughs> and in the springtime, you have some really good pole vaulters. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know much about Wadsworth except that. Uh, but this is a lovely community. Thank you again for having me. I really appreciate it. And um, hope, to, hope to, to see you soon. I'm going to come check out your, your museum on uh, Saturday. I want to invite you up to Bedford to see ours and also uh, invite you all to participate in the Northeast Ohio Local History Fair in April, either as an organization, Roger, hint, hint, or just to come visit um, and see. We had, 30, we had 30 historical groups from as far west as Kelly's Island and as far east as, as Painesville last year. Um, it's a free event. We'd love to have you. Yes, you are. You are. Yes, it's you are. Day. I will be there. I will be there. So we'll be here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Looking forward to that. So, uh, so. One other piece of business, and then sure. we can finish up too. Actually, I have to run. This is our overnight with our fourth graders, so 